He's just standing there, menacingly! Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the 38th episode of The Adam King Show. I am your host, Adam King, and we are back after a hiatus. We were hosting War Room while Alex was away on vacation. Owen was bumped up to uh, the AJ spot, and I was fortunate enough to host The War Room. I want to encourage all my listeners to go out and listen to those episodes on War Room. They were very exciting. We had great interviews, and we are following up with an even better interview today. We have the one and only john doyle joining us on the adam king show john how are you doing today doing very well thanks for having me got this cool little graphic here i made for you check out this new <laughs> software i can like move it across the screen in live time that's very good production value i know right it's uh here let's put you in the corner heck off commies true yeah so uh john there's so much to talk about there's so many subjects first of all the world's burning down and like there's still like hundreds of thousands of children that are being sex trafficked across the world i know that's a big issue for you um but before we get into all that mumbo jumbo and mess which we're going to share later i want to ask you about heck off commies and how it got sure. started what's the whole background of heck off commies and why the name heck off commies well, it's, uh, I think it started when I was 18. I, I knew I wanted to get involved in making political content. I needed a, a name for the show and I didn't want to do no offense, like the John Doyle show or something. Cause there's a million of those, like, you know, the name shows. And I thought that I no offense, man, if my name wasn't Adam King, I would never choose the Adam King show. Exactly. And it's a great, <laughs> I have a great name. name. Um, so I decided to go with uh, something like more satirical, something kind of self-referential. So I, I liked the idea of like heck off commie because it's like a command. I'm telling the communists to go away. Mm -hmm. It's also kind of like, um, I don't want to say cringe because I don't want to betray my former self, but it is sort of like, you know, more base level internet humor. Mm -hmm. um, it, of course, like the intro is like this black and white, leave it to beaver parody type thing. So it's worked really well in that it, does appeal to like the widest net of conservatives like any person who's predisposed towards like right wing thinking is going to like see that and understand like okay friend um and so that's worked really well but then also it disarms a lot of criticism from people who would be inclined to come after me because if i'm getting like mass reported for making content about xyz and it comes across the desk of some like blue hair person at youtube and then they click mm -hmm. on it and it's like this, you know, kid and he's like got the intro and he's like LARPing and everything. They're just going to be like, oh, this kid's like kind of a dweeb. And then they're just going to move on and not perceive me to be um, like a threat to, you know, the security of their platform or what they're trying to control in terms of the messaging. So um, I think it started out as me thinking something was funny. And then as it's aged, it's actually become something that's very strategically useful uh, in terms of the overall branding of the show. So mm -hmm. that's kind of kind of the timeline there. And your logos are sick too. They're like 1960s Mad Men, Mad Men yeah. retro. I dig it. Which is like Thank the you. whole commie. I live here in California. Where are you at? Uh, so originally from Southeast Michigan. Now I'm over in Dallas, Texas. Okay. Dallas, Fort Worth. Yep. Not bad. Close to InfoWars headquarters. You ever make yes. it over to Austin? Yes. Uh, I've been to Austin before. I haven't been to the studios before. Okay uh we have new relationship goals <laughs> <laughs> so um tell me about your show you're on youtube and you're on instagram first of all like are you a fed like how are you able to be so successful no. on these programs i think these it's platforms? just like yeah i think it's the the messaging um i think that you can basically get away with saying whatever you want as long as you're framing it properly because the people who are working at these corporations that are in charge of shadow banning they do receive level or um instructions from like the top down but the people who are actually like making these decisions tend to be very uh we'll say intellectually mediocre people and they're far more concerned with what they believe the intent behind the ideas are than they are the ideas in themselves so if they believe that you're saying you know uh certain crime statistics or you know what have you it's because you like hate black people or you're racist or something mm -hmm. like that and then they'll want to target you but I, th I found that if you frame information or arguments in a way that is very neutral uh very sort of friendly and amicable 
you can pretty much get away with saying anything. And people who know what you're talking about will get something out of it. People who don't, maybe not so much. But uh, that's kind of been my strategy. Try to, you know, come at everything from a very sort of neutral, um, unanimated angle. That's the other thing mm. that they don't like. They don't like it if you're speaking very passionately about controversial issues. You have to speak about it very sort of matter of factly. Just, like, hey, I'm not triggering, triggering any alarms. And it's you don't like cuss or do anything in your videos. You don't put any clips to controversial stuff on YouTube. I try not to. Um, occasionally I do. So like I'm not monetized on, uh, on YouTube because mm -hmm. of things like that. But as long as I can still you know get my content out there, I'm okay with that. So because, uh, like I said before the show, we got kicked off YouTube. or We're in a 90-day suspension, but I think they're pretty much ready to give us the boot. We got uh, two flags and then uh, a, 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 a strike. And the strike, they gave us the 90 days. We got, I had a rabbi on talking about the war in Ukraine. It's called the Kabbalah of Ukraine because we're Jewish and weird like that. So the episode's called the Kabbalah of Ukraine. And... Um, it was taken down for medical misinformation. And then the second video that we had on YouTube that was taken down was a commentary on all this. I had a Supreme Court expert on, and we were, had this commentary on all the up and coming docket of cases for the for quarter one of 2023. 20, uh, and that yeah. was taken down for nudity, you know, and, and I appealed yeah. both decisions and I actually got handwritten letters sent back saying that um nope we're taking them down for nudity we're taking them down for misinformation and then the final blow came episode 34 i interviewed laura loomer and that was all they needed they saw laura loomer right. and they were just like oh we hate that girl we got to get rid of her we got to get yeah. rid of her friends he must be friends with her we got to get rid of him too that's probably what it is too and at the time this was happening um they probably knew the infowars affiliation they probably knew the the laura loomer affiliation mm -hmm. and they don't like that they really like hate these sort of networks of people on the right um which yeah. i think is another thing that's been useful is i sort of have operated as like um almost this automated or not automated this like autonomous guy you know i don't really have guests on my channel i just kind of like monologue but i've done uh like my video on the russia ukraine thing i think got over like a quarter million views and it was nice. like this big two hour long dissertation going over the history of the conflict. And it wasn't even, and this at the time, by the way, that this was posted, this was in April of 2022. So this was like two months after it had popped off. This was before it was okay for conservatives to say, well, you know, I don't know if we should be giving all this money to Ukraine and blah, blah, blah. My take was farther than that. It wasn't even just like, we shouldn't be involved. It was actually saying like, hey, you know, Russia actually is kind of justified in what they're doing, which at the time was so controversial to say, but for some reason, I was allowed to say that on YouTube. Mm. And I really do think it's because of just the way that I framed everything, um, the length of the, the content. Um, it, it really does appeal to, I think, better class of audience member. Um, and I think that they're aware of that. It's not like because you got an uncle who's a fed. Uh, no. <laughs> so one of the things, I actually want to show you this clip. I'm going to throw it up on the... Uh, the screen really quick. This is one of the, you know, for everybody who wonders about InfoWars and our impact, you know, we're up there with like Google and everybody. I mean, check out these these numbers that we got. This is the number of our live feed, what the live feed has done in views since January of 2023. Is that sick? Wow, you, yeah. You could see that, right? Yeah. This software is amazing. Ecamm. <laughs> it's really a great software. Uh, boom. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, they, they said the truth is, is we got, you know, 4.45 billion views in three years. That's not stupid. Yeah, no, that's very serious. And InfoWars has been one of those examples where you guys have built up your reputation prior to the advent of social media mm -hmm. and and people thought that deplatforming you would work in terms of shutting out your reach but it really hasn't because right. uh like I, I mean infowars doesn't need social media to be infowars and so oh, okay you right. can't you know be on twitter or youtube or anymore well it doesn't it doesn't matter because you guys have been fortunate enough to build up your own infrastructure because you have a very supportive audience a very sophisticated operation um and so yeah it is really impressive to see how you know, there are all the, uh, these um, other like mainstream media networks, especially on the left, who would be like, who would kill to have those types of numbers, mm -hmm. but they, they could just never have anything close to it. 
Speaking of our numbers, I want to direct our audience to InfoWarsStore.com. This is my new graphic for InfoWars Store right here. Click on this QR code, go to InfoWars Store, buy something to support the InfoWar. John, what do you do? Do you ever shop at InfoWars Store? Have you bought anything? Oh, I'm a veteran of the InfoWars Store, yeah. Nice. What did you what do you like to buy from InfoWars Store? I do I remember I was wearing my Hillary for prison shirts to school yeah. back in the day. The uh, a lot of shirts, a lot of supplements. Uh, What's your favorite uh, supplement at InfoWars Store? Probably super male vitality. I mean, it is you got it. You're not going to reinvent the wheel there. It's got to be super male vitality, but also water filters, especially for the shower. Um, it's so important, so crucial. If you can just like reduce your fluoride intake by like 50, 60 mm percent, -hmm. I mean, you're going to already notice a huge difference. And a lot of that is your shower. I mean, that's like the greatest exposure you have to water other than like drinking it is like in the shower. I mean, it's gallons and gallons of water that is touching your skin, absorbing into your bloodstream. And so, yeah, you got to make sure that's filtered. Listeners, you heard it. Click this QR code right above my head. Go to InfoWarsStore.com. Buy something. Support these podcasts. we got like hundreds of great podcasts, unbelievable content that we never stop delivering to the InfoWars community. So um, we're going to jump into some heavy topics now. We've gone through, uh, you know, the basics. And um, it's time for us to really hit something hard. Um, how, are you familiar with Dust Magazine by any chance? I'm not. So we have broken a story, if I can find it here. I really messed up all my clips. Um, we have broken a story on a magazine, a, an elite pedophile magazine called Dust Magazine. Uh, the plural we is uh, me and a partner of mine, base.latin on Instagram. I don't know if you follow him, but yes, check this out. I can't see more of that. I can't. I can't take any more of that. It's too much for me. I gotta. I gotta turn off. The video goes on. There's more magazine covers. The craziest thing about this magazine is there's like each magazine cover is at least fifty to a hundred thousand dollar photo shoot. So this is like a big magazine. But have you ever seen Dust Magazine at any newsstand? Um, maybe in passing, like at one of those big, you know, corner stores that has all the newspapers out. Maybe it, uh, it's Well, that was more like a satirical joke. They actually don't sell them at newsstands. They're not available. Anywhere. Oh, they don't? Okay. No, it's a private pedo magazine. You have to subscribe and it's only for like elite pedophiles in the fashion industry. So we've been working on this yeah. story on uh, Francois Henry Pinault, who is the owner of the... Uh, large fashion conglomerate. They own uh, the Balenciaga and all sorts of different brands in right. in, in that. $36 billion. He's the one married to some Hayek. Um, and 
and uh, he's in this elite pedo cult. He's the he's the ringleader of this elite pedo cult, and um, the the main characters, Marina Abramovich, um, uh, um, you know she's she she's all over the place with those celebrities and the Rockefellers and whatnot. Um, did you happen? Do you happen to know who she is? Uh, not by name. I mean, I think the name rings a bell, but I'm vaguely familiar with some of these different circles that exist. Yeah. Um, so she's like this witch that like is like this this witch that like exists and uh, goes and speaking to her. She does uh, spirit cooking with John Podesta. You remember all oh that stuff? Oh, my gosh. Yes. Clinton? You yes. know what? That's so funny because the, the photos that you were showing on screen reminded me of the artwork that the Podesta brothers had. Um, on their properties, which maybe was her artwork. Yeah, that was her artwork. And she's one of the main architects behind. Uh, you saw that with the woman holding the kid's eyes shut in that. Yeah. That's Marina Bramovich. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, this is. Yeah. I remember. So that. she's a part of like this whole new age cult. And I just found that she took Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine to like this satanic wall. I don't even know if I could find a picture of it. Let's see if I could find a picture of it. It's kind of crazy. But um, she took Mer uh, Vladimir Zelensky, Zelensky, Marine Abramovich, and it was like this ceremonial type uh, type of thing. Um, the, uh, da, 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 da. I can't find pictures. Oh, here it is. I found pictures of it. Ukrainian government. Uh, nope, that's not it. I'm trying to find a picture of it. But uh, there's this wall that she made. It's like a satanic wall. Let me see if I could share this screen really quick. Uh, screen share. Okay, you see this mess of pictures over here? Yeah. That's the wall. It's like this like this mud wall that they created and um she uh vladimir Zelensky actually went to this wall exhibit with her while he was engaged in this war uh which is shocking to me but um what's your take on the whole ukrainian war when do you think it's going to end soon Probably not. I don't know. I, I think that both sides have an interest in escalation. Um, well, both sides, I mean, like the, you know, the United States and then also Ukraine mm -hmm. um, and Europe. I don't think that Russia really wants escalation, but I also think that they have an incentive to see the objectives uh, fulfilled. But yeah, I, I don't think that we're going to see anybody in office anytime soon who has the ability and the sort of diplomatic uh, inclination to try to reach some sort of agreement between the two sides. Um, and that's unfortunate because I certainly don't want World War III to happen. I don't think most people want World War III to happen, especially because we don't really even have a country worth fighting for anymore, frankly. Uh, mm. This is not like something I want to lay my life on the line for. I mean, at this point, when you're like going and fighting a war, you're fighting a war for democracy, which is defined as like feminism and anal You don't think we have a country worth fighting for? No, no, I don't. You don't think the Constitution is worth fighting for or anything like that? I think the Constitution is worth fighting for as an idea, but I think that people want to speak very... You mean like what our country has become, like exporting homosexuality over the world is not worth fighting for? Absolutely. Not that the yeah. American flag and the history... And sure, the... sure. Okay, if, I just if, wanted to make it clear. Like, for example, hypothetically, if all of the sudden, say you had like a, you know, Washington reincarnated and he's leading a, a neo-continental army and we're going to take back the country... I'm there in a second, but mm -hmm. am I going to, you know, put on the uniform to go and fight so that some little girl in the Middle East can learn about gender theory? Absolutely not. Um, but you know, the priority dude, has to be George Washington historically fought with an entire transgendered army. Is that? Yeah, that's you. probably what they're going to say now. Dude, they all. No, dude, this is real. They all had pink hair. Dude, you should have seen the Battle of Manhattan. Right. The reason why George Washington lost the Battle of Manhattan was because all his soldiers showed up with lipstick and purses on. 
Yeah, they're season. gonna they're gonna have a lot of the like AI art regenerated to depict the uh, the Continental Army and also probably as a humiliation ritual, they're probably gonna depict the Confederate Army to be like a bunch of like trannies or something like that, just to right. further humiliate the the, uh, the dead soldiers. Honestly, but what a badass George Washington! I mean, like the dude is like twenty two years old out of West Virginia. He fights like this whole war. The 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 final battle is supposed to be the Battle of Manhattan, and he gets creamed. And he comes back, crosses the Delaware in the middle of the night on Christmas Day, slaughters the British, wins the war. It's like unbelievable story. The Battle of Manhattan. Are yeah, you a war buff? Is, uh, not as much as I would like to be. I think uh, a lot of that just comes with age. Um, I have a very general knowledge. What are you trying to say, dude? A, You're like 23. A lot of that comes. I'm a, just teasing. I do have a, a great appreciation, though, for like a lot of the men that uh, that built this country more so than I because a lot of people like to have this idea of like, oh, you know, I like the founding fathers. But you really study these guys. I mean, they were exceptional. It wasn't just mm -hmm. like some man rising to the occasion. I mean, you look at like the life that George Washington lived. I mean, you see excellence in every pursuit that he mm -hmm. that he undertook um, and truly probably the greatest American to ever live. I don't know if we'll ever Truly. be blessed with somebody like that again, but uh, there's a reason that he is who he is. You know, people think, oh, you know, yeah. we like George Washington because he was the first president. And it's like, well, there's a little bit more to it than that. It's not just that he was the first president. I mean, he is like the standard for every man in this country. Yeah, you know, they actually tried to make him king. There was like a yes. humongous movement to make him king, but in, he rejected. He didn't even want to be president. Yep. Yeah, he, uh, he, and, he chose not uh, to. Actually, in the other room, I have like a, a, a um, copy of every presidential inauguration speech. Mm -hmm. And George Washington's speech is like four seconds long, four sentences long. It's so funny. It's like pretty much like I'm here to do this. So let's get started. That's it. <laughs> like it's, yeah, a lot it's of, an amazing uh, speech. A lot of really good lessons to be learned from that. The nature of the person who should seek office is probably someone who usually doesn't want it naturally, which is to say that typically people like, for example, George Washington was by all means an elitist. I mean, he was a, an aristocrat. He was very successful, very intelligent, like top of the line kind of guy. And so this is a type of person who really has no incentive to want to get involved in something like politics. He's very happy to go and, you know, live on his a state and you know live with his uh his wife and just do the rest of his you know life as that but to get involved in something like politics is something very ugly that is usually only appealing to people who otherwise couldn't be successful so people who are willing to like sell their souls for political power and for money they'll do it that way but you know someone like donald trump for example a very successful businessman gets involved in politics because he cares about the country and doesn't want to like you know die seeing it go down the drain without at least saying i threw my hat in the ring right I think george washington is very similar in that way where it's like look i'm not in love with this idea of politics i'm not in love with becoming president but i'll do it because i think i owe a service to my country and those are the type of people who usually are the best leaders people who don't really care about power about the you know the benefits of it the mm -hmm. sort of avenues of corruption and opportunity that open up for them um and the problem with our government system now is it's reached a point where it incentivizes the exactly opposite type of person to climb the ladder the mm -hmm. person who wants it the most is most willing to lie to their constituents to people to take bribes to get into bed with special interests that will then install them into these avenues of power um and it's just entirely it's almost like completely opposite the spectrum from when say washington set the standard with his mm. uh, presidential address so what's your uh 2024 hopeful are you rolling with chris christie oh absolutely no no <laughs> no no, no, no. Rolling I, uh, with yeah. chris christie. <laughs> no i am uh, i'm still happily aboard the trump train i'll show you a funny video i just made this meme and I'm going to put it out there. I've been making Chris, because I could not believe that Chris Christie is so fat. Yeah, he's like a circle. <laughs> he's like a perfect circle. He's like that guy from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Yeah. Um, but uh, this is going to take me a, a second to get these Chris Christie clips. But um, the uh, you, were, you were saying you are on the Trump train for 2024? Absolutely, yes. Okay, keep both. Okay, save to files, save, keep both. Let's let's play a, a Chris Christie one for you. 
They're funny, dude. Uh, I'm proud of myself. If you don't like it, just pretend to laugh, please, because I have a very weak and fragile ego. Just kidding. Um, I, I don't have a fragile ego. I take super mild vitality. What are you talking about? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> the, the cure for that. Exactly. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I'm stupid. Okay, and then the second one, actually, this is a real clip of Chris Christie. Chris Christie trying to win the biker vote. That actually makes him almost look cool. I'll never forget that line he had in 2016. He just, he had something he was talking about, like a sack of donuts. And he used the word sack to describe his like unit of measurement for donuts. And, and that was just like, you can't come back from that. I mean, you've just revealed that that is your go-to unit. And now he measurement. looks like a sack of donuts. Yeah, he's, uh, they're not sending their best to New Jersey, I guess. But what do you think he's, why do you think he wants to run for office? Like, what's the point of Chris Christie running for office at this point? raise the national profile maybe get a job in the uh in the next administration if a republican wins um that's usually what it is you make money too i mean you know people look at like people running for president and they're like they have no shot it's like they know that i mean these people aren't totally stupid but it's like okay like you run for president now you're in a position where you can take money from americans and you give it to your friends you know dispense patronage pay oh, back some great favors. Job. Yeah. And, you know, you're campaigning, you know, you're put out a book and you've got your name, you've got media hits. It's a really good thing to uh, to move your career forward. And then maybe the cherry on top is you get a job in the next administration if you, you know, drop out and endorse whoever you you're going to hedge your bets on, um, which I, if I recall correctly, that was what was going on in 2016 with uh, with Trump's first administration. He gave uh, Chris Christie the job, like overseeing his transition into the White House or something. And then Jared Kushner, I think, actually lobbied to have him removed. And so he was removed from that. But maybe he's he's punished. Maybe he's on his Chris Christie uh, revenge tour and he's coming after Donald Trump or something. I don't know. I'm actually really glad that he's running for president because we need somebody for Donald Trump to make fun of on the debate stage. And already right. it's gonna, he's going to have to have two podiums just so he doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. He's like the guy in, uh, in WWE where they have like Hulk Hogan wrestle, like some really small guy <laughs> to make Hulk Hogan look better. That's Chris Christie. It's His signature move easy. is he just rolls around the ring like the ball from Indiana Jones and yeah, squashes yeah, yeah. his enemies. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny all right but you said something very interesting you spoke about a book tour you know that's kind of what they do when they leave office did you happen to see over the weekend that james comey got loomered uh, on his book tour no so i got a clip of it james comey got confronted by laura loomer on um his book tour and uh it's an unbelievable video. Let me get it. Da da da. Dude, my clips are all jacked up today. You know, I'm have it must be like a mercury retrograde or something. <laughs> like I said, I'm stupid. Um so yeah, so she confronted him in um at his book signing and got thrown out and it started this internet sensation and then Owen Troyer followed up in Austin with uh, another great troll of the legendary James Comer, Comey. Um, here, let me throw this video and we can watch it and get your comments. I've been criticized, and I know you don't know this, but I've been criticized. <laughs> 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 and so that's why I kind of kept it quiet while I was working on it. But here's the thing, I know I can write, you know, I've always loved stories and loved writing. And I've always thought, and I don't even believe this, that all good lawyers are great storytellers. Trial lawyers, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> you may not want a tax lawyer. <laughs> 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 so, so, 
I think we all know, James Comey, that you're a great storyteller because you made up the entire story about Crossfire Hurricane. So it's really fitting that a criminal like yourself wrote a crime novel. Do you remember me? Remember me from your book signing? It's really fitting. It takes a criminal to be able to write a crime novel. And you know, John Durham recently said, you talk about being criticized. I'm not afraid to criticize you. You know, you recently, John Durham, his report came out and found that the FBI under your watch, the FBI under your watch acted inappropriately and contrary to fidelity to the law. So I think, I think that your next crime novel should be about a criminal and incompetent FBI director who fed false information to the federal government and the press to stage a coup against a sitting United States president. That's what I think. That's what I think. Why don't you write a, a crime novel about yourself? You should write a crime novel about yourself. You need to leave. Five minutes. Very true. Time to leave. He says he likes criticism. Write a crime novel about yourself. You're not getting anywhere. Get out of here. It takes a criminal to know a criminal. Get out of here. Can you tell us why, as a criminal, you're open crossfire and hurricane? Oh, I can read. Why don't you read the jury report? Read the jury report. Read John Durham's Get report. Here. Read John Durham's Get report here. and you'll learn about a real life criminal. A real life criminal. A real life criminal named James Comey. It's not a fiction. It's not a novel. It's a real crime story. You're going to get locked up, Comey. You are criminal. And when Donald Trump wins in 2024, you're going to jail. You are going to jail, Tommy. Pretty cool stuff, man. I have like a special contempt for baby boomers who are like, like imagine going to a James Comey book event. Like imagine being that person. Imagine living your life and every decision you've made leads up to the point where you file in to sit down to watch a James Comey book presentation. And then <laughs> this woman is disrupting it and you're like, I'm not going to let that. That was like more energy I've ever seen. Like the baby boomers who are, you know, not all of them, it's the liberal ones, but like these are all these like washed up hippie types who single handedly ushered in the destruction of our country. And they didn't give it, they didn't care at all. They were very happy to have it all happen. But now, when this woman comes in to disrupt their precious James Comey book event, now they're going to come and be like, hey, get out of here. And you need to go. And we like people who actually read books. <laughs> like, I want to suffocate these people with a pillow. I am so sick. <laughs> they're so entitled and stupid. And they think that they're like still, they've all, they've all got this same, like, we were the hippies. Like we've protested the Vietnam war and stuff like that. And it's like, you people cannot go soon enough, frankly. Like, just just leave. You already killed the country. Just leave. <laughs> so. The craziest thing that he's writing a book, a, a crime novel. Like, how strange. Is that like, it's like one of those Saul Alinsky playbook moves. Like, like you out yourself for doing the crime by hiding behind outing yourself for doing the crime by making it in some, like, fictitious way. Right. Like it is like clear, like the Durham report comes out the same week that he goes on a book tour for a crime novel. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah, you got to assume that it's tongue in cheek. Like he's like joking with his buddies about it. Like, oh, yeah, here I am. Next stop in the crime <laughs> novel, like in a big group chat or something like it, they're definitely just like laughing at us. Yeah. Maybe he wrote it for the boomers because, you know, they all read their crime novels. Yes. Yeah, they love that. They eat that stuff up. 
That until they lose their driver's license and then they can't read anymore either. Yeah, and then they get put into a nursing home because they didn't like take care of their kids properly or something. <laughs> Seriously, dude, like I mean you look at like what's happening to this generation of people and they are so miserable and they have like such like they don't under, like I would be okay with it if they understood the civilizational head start that they had. But the way yeah. that they speak about my generation, are you how old are you? I'm thirty nine. So you're technically a millennial, right? I'm a millennial, yeah. I think the way, the way they speak about millennials and my generation. I actually is... consider myself more though a systemic anomaly, but okay, okay, fair enough. But uh, they they speak about our generations so like selfishly. They, they, what they are you at? Them. You're so young. Are, like Gen a Z. Y, a Z. Yep, Gen Z. You so, would have like... you would have thought they would start at A because if they go Y and then Z, what comes after Z? You know, it's yeah, like so it's, stupid. It's, yeah, they had because Gen X and then I guess Gen. Mm. Millennials, Gen Z, and now they're doing Gen Alpha and Gen Beta. So I think if you're born after 2015, you're Gen Alpha. Which I mean, that's pretty cool. I, I like to be Gen Alpha, but I just hope that they're all not Betas because they get vaxxed to death. Yeah, probably. Are you vaccinated? No, 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 no. Praise God. Praise yeah. God. Yeah, I don't know if we've had a vaccinated guest. You're episode 38, and we've probably had like close to 50 guests. It's good. Yeah, don't break the streak. You you might get uh, like spike proteins in the electronic transmission of the studio or something. It might infect you if you have a vaccinated guest. Yeah, Chase Geyser, who's a mutual friend of ours, I told him you were coming on the show. He was on the show a while back and we were, he asked me, he's like, are, are you dating? And I said, I said, yeah, of course, you know, and he's like, would you ever date or marry a vaccinated girl and i said no and he's like well what if she's cool i said no because that either way even if she's cool my kids are going to be born with wings and feathers and me as a yeah. jew it'll probably come out as horns and then you'll have nick fuentes out there saying see i told you the jews have horns i disavow yeah i disavow <laughs> that <laughs> that's funny <laughs> so it's cool that you're 23 because uh you know it's like the whole nick fuentes age group what's your take on nick fuentes we have uh, we have our disagreements on things. Uh, he's come after me quite a few times throughout my existence mm. in politics. I've come after him a couple times, but I, I think we both have uh, bigger fish to fry at this point. So there was yeah, there he's was a time he's got to where... worry about being outed as a homosexual now. Uh, maybe maybe that's on his uh, his <laughs> docket. Yeah, we. Uh, but I he's done that... some weird stuff. Did you see that video where he went on a date with a guy? Yes, yes, like, I have uh, in that video. He looked pretty comfortable. Know. Yeah, there were uh, there were a lot of really good Catholics in his audience at that time who wanted an explanation as to what went on there, and he sort right. of seemed to double down on it and say, "Well, this is like a leftist talking point trying to slander me." It was never really addressed, but uh, there were yeah, there were a lot of questions around there. Also, I thought it was so crazy that like in back in November when he went on his like "We Hate the Jews" tour with Kanye that he was like saying like repetitively, like he wants Kanye for president because Kanye is the only Christian president. And like yeah. two weeks before Kanye was literally the runway model at the Balenciaga child pedo mud festival. And then he has like a way awakening with God moment. And like, he's just a God fearing Christian presidential candidate who hates Jews. And Nick Fuentes is like, that's my Christian leader. And then of course, Nick Fuentes a few months later, gets outed as being like a total homosexual with Ali Alexander and Milo Yiannopoulos. I think they just had like a, they, they probably had like slumber parties or something back in the day where, and there's some beef going on and you, I don't know the, with their lovers quarrel, the three of them, you know? Yeah. The, the Kanye for president thing, I understand why he got involved with that because he's always been a huge Kanye West fan. So if mm. you know your if your idol comes to you and says, I I'll thought you were going to say grifter, but yeah, Kanye there's, West, fine. That's that's so, cool too. <laughs> so there's there's no way that to like turn that down. And so the thing is though, it is it is kind of like a shameless grip going back, you know, from that to the Trump thing. After it's obvious that Kanye wasn't going to be president. I mean, he's smart mm. enough to know that, but it's sort of a thing where it's like, you know, why not give it a shot just because it's such a cool opportunity. So I understand it, but I do wish that there was a little bit more acknowledgement of like, yeah, this was obviously bullshit. Yeah, we're like grifting, and now you know we're going to be back on the Trump train. We're going to join the rest of, join the rest of everybody uh, on the Trump train. So, yeah, we don't we don't forget, dude, who uh, betrays the Trump train. Like I'm not like 
I'm on the Trump train some days and other days I'm not. Like I, it took me a lot. I have I have this really close friend of mine who has been working on me hard to get back on the Trump train because I was a hundred percent on Trump until the vaccine situation. He just became a a vax pusher. Yeah. And then I got back on the Trump train after the CNN thing. I thought he did a really good job on the CNN thing. And then um, after DeSantis's botched thing, I was like, okay, fine. Trump's the guy. And then he goes out in Iowa and starts talking about vaccines again like a dumbass. Yeah. I, uh, Harrison Smith actually has a really good take on this. Um, he's got a clip, I think, on his Twitter that I always repost whenever someone brings up Trump and the vaccine. But it's like when evaluating the different political figures, I mean, it, it could not have been anybody else but Trump. Anybody else in Trump's situation definitely would have done the same thing with the vaccine, 100%. Mm -hmm. I mean, if Trump is the guy who is the most likely to be able to withstand establishment pressures and forces, which I think he is, even if not as much as we would like, he's still, you know, the most independent. He has the least ties to them. He has his own money. He really doesn't need to work with these people unless he's cutting political deals, which he's had some good ones. He's had some bad ones. But any other person in that position. Definitely Ron DeSantis, too, would have been pushing the vax. I mean, DeSantis is the one who locked down his state. DeSantis was pushing yeah. the vax, too. Trump had no authority to lock down, you know, the state. Yeah, he was working with Anthony Fauci, a guy who's been in office for, excuse me, who's been in that position for like 20-something years or something. Even longer, I think. He was like the longest, like, uh, what is it, like the longest federal employee that's been on the payroll in that position. Something like that was the common talking point. But people forget just how terrified people were especially baby boomers who are whether or not we like it our base they were terrified of covid they wanted the vaccine they wanted to flatten the curve and so at the time there were all of these like pressures on trump and they were going to have the vaccine anyway so it was just a matter of is trump going to get credit for it or are we going to delay it and biden's going to get credit for it so trump made a decision uh, I don't know if it was the right decision but I can't say I I blame him in that situation when you've got all this pressure you know you're going into an election, you've got this pandemic that you know is BS, you know that it's all manufactured. So he made a decision. I don't know if it was the right decision, but I don't know in that situation if there really is a right decision. I mean, you have literally the entire world orchestrating this, this pandemic, as they say, and you're just one. So like, I don't understand what people wanted him to do. I think they're just mad at the situation and kind of using Trump as a scapegoat. I think it is stupid that he does brag about the vaccine, but at the same time, just don't get it. Like, mm. if you're mad that you got the vaccine, ultimately, that's your fault. I mean, you chose to get it. It's like, oh, well, I had, you know, a job and I had a lot of people lost jobs for this. People lost jobs and livelihoods so much to avoid getting that. So at a certain point, it's like, yeah, Trump, you know, is getting it. But at a certain point, it's like, you know, people on our side aren't getting it anyways. So, yeah, it was clearly a test of free will. You know, like yeah. everything was measured in the scales of justice above with God. It was like, what's the most important thing to you? And it was like. So for some people, they were like, if I don't get it, I can't travel. So travel was like the most important thing. I can't see my grandmother. That was the most important thing. They would fire me from my work. Work was the most important thing. Yep. And all these were placed above health. And I think that was like the big problem was they were like placed above health. Yeah. So, you know, then there was us, the ever faithful who uh, did not take the uh, Pfizer epigenetic Nazi Mengele experiment. Yeah, which, you know, it is worth saying as well that I don't know about you, but I know in my experience, I'm in a very fortunate position where I don't have to really face that type of you know decision. I like to think that I would always prioritize my health and not getting something like that, not making a gesture of submission to like a global satanic empire. But my livelihood really wasn't on the line. Uh, my travel really wasn't. I like I really didn't have to do anything other than just, no, I'm not going to like deal with this. I'll just be inconvenienced mm -hmm. the same way everyone else was. But my job wasn't on the line because my job is to like, you know, do this. Um, so I do understand that I'm in a very fortunate circumstance and I consider myself very yeah. blessed for that. So I do try to exercise some humility when I'm telling people just like, just don't get it. Like, I understand it's not as simple um, for everybody else. But at the same time, if you really believe that this is what we know it is, then there is no choice. I mean, obviously, exactly. you can get it. You know, for me, it wasn't about the job because I have the job. My job wasn't affected, but what was affected was my family relationships. And that's where the devil came to try to put sway over me and, 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 and tempt me. And, you know, it, 
it was a very hard decision that I had to make, but it was like, see your grandmother or continue your grandmother's line. So yeah. to me, it was, you know, I'll see you when I see you, grandma. And thank God she's still here. Now they let me see her. But it was kind of funny because in my family, like everybody was so like demented with, with it. Like some people were like, if they had the vaccine, they had the past, they can do everything in society. So like my grandfather was like obsessed with going to Laker games. He was vaccinated. 17, 18,000 people in a stadium, he's vaccinated. But his grandson cannot come over because he's not vaccinated. But he could go out and be at the Lakers with a bunch of unvaccinated people, I'm sure. It was just like such a dichotomous, like consistent lie to oneself. And that's like the hardest thing. Like if you can lie to yourself, that's the hardest thing. Because once you lie to yourself, it's like extremely embarrassing to come out and admit like, oh, I lied to myself. I really screwed myself. So yeah. they try to cover the lie with more lies. And that's kind of like the perpetual lie that gets bigger and bigger and harder to deal with as as the future moves forward um right as we're coming up to an end of this segment i want to touch on your faith because you are a uh, a faith leader i mean you you you're a christian catholic you're a catholic correct yeah and you're do you go to church every sunday and i know you have like strict things like tell me if i'm wrong you, you do like the whole virginity till marriage thing that's like a big thing in your in your podcast right uh, ideally, yeah. Ideally. Yeah. We're all sinners down here, man. Well, yeah, that's the thing. You know, I was raised Catholic and I sort of fell out of it in what I refer to as my edgy atheist phase. Um, and I came back to it once I graduated high school, roughly. And so I definitely made some mistakes that I regret. But Taking out my Bible for this it. segment. Yeah, please, please. Just to have um, right here. So, yeah, I've spoken to my priest about it. I've, uh, I've repented. I've made my peace with God. And you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with having that conversation with my wife if and when the time comes. So, Do you know what God loves more than a perfect person? Uh, I think I know what you're going to say, but tell me. One who repents. Right. This world was actually made for repentance. Yeah. That's why it's so broken. That's why there's so much pain and trauma and filth. Is Without that... There is no point there without brokenness. There's no repentance. There's no, there's nothing, you know, everything yeah. has to come crash in order for that, re, that pure repentance to be born. And inside of that repentance is perfection. That is the, the, the quintessential essence of perfection in this world is uh, repentance. So yeah. I wanted to go down the spiritual path with you because I feel like our movement it's not just a movement of po politics and, and preference, but especially now in like this like openly satanic age, our movement is a revival movement of faith. And, and me as an Orthodox Jew, you as a Catholic, one thing that I find that unites all people on our side of the political fence is we are all people of real faith and real commitment to our faith. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely true. And ultimately, if it is to be successful politically, it, it must be um, correct spiritually because God would never grant something his blessing that is false or, or leading people away from him. So I think you're definitely correct there. And, and that's why a lot of the attempts to sort of obfuscate from like what real, you know, as you say, faith or, or real Christianity um, is is ultimately just leading us back to where we are now. Like with Pride Month, for example, is like an excellent example is you've got all these conservatives like trying to be secular, scratching their head, how they're supposed to come up with an argument for not sexualizing children, but you know, promoting sodomy throughout the culture is still okay, promoting lust throughout the culture is still okay. Even the idea of pride in general, and that's really what it is too. I mean, pride being the ultimate sin, it is so difficult for people to literally kneel and bow their head before a God that they can't see that they're not even sure is there and repent for things that maybe they're not even sure are wrong. Like that is really tough for people to do. But once you mm. crack that nut, then it's just like, it, it, it's so obvious. I mean, obviously I am a sinner. I am flawed. Like I will kneel and I will repent for my sins, but people hate that. There's so much, and you can hear this in them. And I really, I pray for patience in my own life, like trying to work with people because I don't know what the answer is to that. I mean, this is something that I've tried to develop over my life in the last you know, five, six, seven years, having that sense of humility, because you hear it in people, they'll say, well, 
you know, God knows who he made or I'm like this and that's fine. And, you know, it's good enough if I, you know, just say sorry and I don't have to go to confession. So like, in, for example, in the Catholic church, you would have to go to confession. Well, you don't have to, but you are advised very strongly to seek reconciliation. And there's mm-hmm. all these little excuses that people make, which is like, well, I don't have to do this. I don't have to. Gotta. And it, what you hear there is basically saying, well, it's good enough what I want to bring to the table for God. It doesn't really matter what he wants for me or what he tells me to do. What I'm bringing to the table is good enough. And if he doesn't like that, well, he made me this way. And mm-hmm. you really understand how disgusting that is. I mean, he gives mm-hmm. you this life as a gift and you want to spit back in his face and say, mm-hmm. well, I'd rather go watch the football game or I'd rather go to brunch with my friends instead of go to mass or something like that. And it's like, look, you're here for one purpose. And when you realize that, there is no excuse. It's going to be uncomfortable and you're going to realize like, oh man, I really actually have to keep a faith schedule. Mm -hmm. I actually have to, you know, put my money where my mouth is. And that's tough for people. But once you're there and once you see it, you realize what the priority actually is and how important Mm -hmm. it is. Uh, And it makes it very anxiety inducing seeing all of the people around you who you love knowing these people aren't going to get to heaven. And it's not like a a judgmental thing where it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so good and these people are so bad. But it's like, oh man, we all just have a lot of work to Mm -hmm. do. And I really hope that I can be patient enough to kind of like slowly work with these people and and be understanding and be kind. Because if you take it a little bit too far, then they're like, oh, well, you're trying to proselytize. Oh, well, you're Mm -hmm. judging me. And then they just completely shut you and God out of their hearts. So yeah, Yeah. I feel like I'm almost like like a a bomb diffuser sometimes or like a, a lock picker in Skyrim or something, just trying to like, like navigate through people's spiritual minefields and, and not give them any reason to, you know, activate their pride or their ego or their envy and just yeah. very slowly talk about God mm-hmm. to them because there is just so many opportunities because of the culture for people to just completely shut it out. There's a concept in Hebrew called tochacha and tochacha is like rebu- rebuke. And um, it's strongly discouraged. There's like this ancient protocol on how to give rebuke. And they advise us that if you don't follow the protocol, don't even try it. Because if you do it wrong, you could push somebody further down a path, even farther away from God, which is very dangerous. And what we call it a Kiddush Hashem when you do something to glorify God's name is called a Kiddush Hashem. The opposite is called a Hillel Hashem. The, the desecration of God's name. So when giving rebuke to the sinner, it could go either way. And there's this concept called kiruv, which is like ingathering and bringing people in. And, and it's such a delicate and fine art to execute because you really have to take into account their vulnerability, where they're at and where they're holding and what they'll be able to, uh, what they'll be able to, um, what they'll be able to do. And so proselytization is very, very crucial element. You know, how do you, how do you inspire faith without turning people off? And I think a lot of the Satanists use that against us to try to discourage us from talking at all about our faith with anybody, you know, like they want us to like be so afraid that we're, because everybody's so sensitive that if, if you say God in front of somebody, they're going to, you know, freak out about something else but yeah um what's what's your take i actually have a, an opinion on this about homosexuality that a lot in the faith world they say like you know it's not how god made you it's and and the answer is yeah actually it is like yeah. what i god did make these people homosexual but more important than that is he gave them free will and the te- their specific like some people he made into murderers you know what i'm saying like the gays should be grateful that their test isn't murder but to not engage is an act of free will and god gave us the torah and the bible and told us what is to do and what is not to do um and i want to get your take on free will and sin and maybe you could share a little bit and elucidate on some of those thoughts too Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, Everybody's got a cross and they often say, well, you know, I experienced these desires, so it must be how God made me because God's not wrong, right? And so they think that that means they have a free license to act on those desires. Mm. That's obviously not true. And it's like, look, the same way that we might have desire to fornicate with women, the same way we might have desire to be violent against our enemies, 
um, they experience desires that are ultimately, you know, maybe more unnatural and perverted, but still sinful nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And it's not our job to excuse those because they experience that desire. I mean, it's actually quite the opposite. I mean, that's like the whole point is we're trying to have control over these earthly uh, desires of the flesh and transcend those towards something more holy. And so, yeah, I mean, and if even like scientifically, if you look at what causes homosexuality, I mean, it isn't like natural. It's always uh, like there are certain biological predispositions. Like if you have more, um, say, feminine prenatal hormone exposure or you are experienced to more estrogens growing up because of the things in the water and in the food packaging and things like that, you will be more likely to develop and manifest homosexual behavior but it won't ever manifest without some sort of environmental influence, meaning something like uh, something traumatic, some disordered interruption in your natural development mm. as a young man. That's always what happens. And that can be something very extreme, like being molested, or it can be something less extreme, like, you know, walking in on your mother while she's delivering a, a child because she's a midwife. Mm. That was a story I read one time. It was a, a little boy who walked in on his mother who was delivering a baby because she was a midwife. And his, his first exposure to the female body was traumatic for him because he's mm. like seven, eight years old. There's this woman who's lying on this bed and she's naked. Uh, she's screaming. There's blood everywhere. And it was yeah. very difficult for him to develop natural attraction towards the female body because he had that experience. Um, wow. And this is what they would call conversion therapy, which really just means talk therapy to sort out why you experience these feelings towards other men. Um, because it's not obviously normal, but it's also destructive. Uh, it's actually a form of like sadomasochism because mm -hmm. when you partake in homosexual activities, you're damaging your body. You are not only because obviously you're damaging your body, but it, it opens up avenues for so many more diseases and types of cancer. Um, yeah. and I don't know if you know, this is like probably one of the most fascinating statistics I ever heard. The life expectancy of the practicing homosexual is diminished more than the life expectancy of the average practicing smoker. The average smoker wow. will shave will shave 11 years off their life. The average homosexual shaves 20 years off their life expectancy because of the STIs, because of the other illnesses and, and risks of inner, inju uh, injury, uh, suicidal ideation even, because you know there's no group of people on the planet who has more per capita mental illness than LGBT people. Mm -hmm. People think, oh, well, that's because they're stigmatized. That's not exactly the case. I mean, you go to like Northern Europe, they're very tolerant and they have identical rates of mental illness. Um, and even, you know, the rate of suicide, which I think is a pretty good probably metric for somebody's mental well-being. You look at like Jews during, you know, the Holocaust, you look at slaves in America, black slaves under Jim Crow even. They weren't killing themselves nearly at the rate that gay people and trans people are. So the question is why? It yeah. makes more sense if you think that there's something – down or upstream from all of that, that manifests as the depressive disorders and the anxiety mm -hmm. disorders and the personality disorders, and then also the homosexual or transsexual behavior. But there's something upstream right. from that that's flowing into all of that. So the question is, okay, well, what might that be? It's usually some type of trauma. And that's mm -hmm. why, you know, a lot of like people with, you know, bipolar disorder or depression, they self-harm, they cut themselves, they burn themselves. I think it could very easily be argued that having sex with another man is a form of like, you know, masochistic, uh, like, you know, self-destructive behavior because you're literally like destructing your own body and it's bad for you. It's unhealthy. And it's also like very humiliating and, and wrong. It's confusing. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, the Bible lists the punishment as being motimut. You will surely die. That's what it mm -hmm. says. It doesn't say death be upon you. It says you're, you're going to die if you do that. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like, if you eat acid or arsenic or, you know, other things, it's like, you're going to die. And so the Bible yep. says, if you engage in homosexuality, mochimut is the punishment. And uh, you see these, they, and that's a very interesting statistic that they, um, that they uh, have shorter lifespans, especially all these yeah. kids that cut off their genitals when they're young. I mean, it's so sad. Yeah, oh the, the tr transsexuals are even worse in terms of all of that. But I don't think enough flack is given towards homosexuality. Uh, and if it weren't for the normalization and prevalence of homosexuality, we would not be having to fight the war on the transgender front right now. So that's why like this month, mm. even for Pride Month, I'm going to be putting out this big piece of content that I'm going to call a uh, working title behind the scenes is the homophobic dissertation. I'm going to just give people a really good condensed primer on the psychological literature behind it, all of the sort of slippery slope stuff. Um, 
what's led to where we are now because people are never you're never going to restore a moral society if you have a proliferation of homosexuality um you can this buy yourself been... some time with the you know fighting the transgender stuff but eventually if you don't go back to the tra uh, the homosexuality stuff you're never you're never going to win this has actually been my favorite pride month the memes are just incredible the yes. outwardness of everybody being so against this is incredible and nobody's being scathed, even people on the left are sick of it. It's the best Pride yeah. Month. Pride Month 2023, go down as legendary. So, yeah, you know, I, I like that, but on the other hand, it is kind of a giant L, the fact that we're like, ah, this month's Pride Month wasn't that bad, and then your grandpa's like, And of course, it, they, of course they choose the month with Father's Day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like one day of Father's Day and a month of gay pride. It's sickening. Yeah. John, I want to thank you for coming on the Adam King Show today. Everybody, you can find him at Heck Off Commies. He's blasting off. He's killing it on the platforms that we're not allowed to go to. And not only that, he's got a fan page that's blowing up more than he's blowing up. So there's really something not. there. That is true. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a great time. Yeah, we'll do it again sometime. I want to do a mashup with you and some other people and get some real comedy going. Right on. All right, Info Warriors, you stay tuned. Peace out. We will see you next week with episode 39, and we are approaching a landmark episode 40. Take Ooh, care. Enough of Bye -bye. that. Go away, damn you. Oh, you're going to get it now. <laughs> Your reward will be great. Be home! <laughs> Whoopsie. Now behold. <laughs> <laughs>